visitors here, I'll, I'll describe the procedure. Uh, so we'll, um, Mr. Bates will uh, give a, a, a lecture of approximately 45 to 50 minutes uh, on his material, just a, just a presentation. And then we will follow with about a, a 10 minute period of questions from the general audience. And when that's done, uh, I will excuse uh, everyone who's not on the, on the uh, examining committee from the room, and then we will have a, a private examination with Mr. Bates, and then we will excuse Mr. Bates, <laughs> and the committee will deliberate and uh, reach, our, reach our decision. And anyway, so I'm pleased to introduce uh, Mr. Robert Bates, who will be speaking on uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So the title, Hyperbolicity Preserving Operators and Classifications of Orthogonal Multiplier Sequences. Uh, you may notice I have a couple of things written on the left and right, so I'll be referring to these uh, throughout the presentation. Uh, we have uh, our orthogonal polynomials, which is what's being referred to in the title. Uh, we'll talk more about multiplier sequences as we go on. Uh, and then on the right are a couple of very key theorems about hyperbolicity preservers, which is also Uh, okay, so a little bit about uh, what we'll go over today. So, presentation outline. Uh, we'll go ahead and uh, discuss a couple of definitions. I'll then take you through a brief history of how we are, where we're at, and then uh, some of the main results of the dissertation. So, quadratic operators and polynomial and percolated eigenvalues and uh, so on and so forth. So, uh, certainly the, the dissertation is uh, quite long. It has a, a lot of uh, little results here and there, but I've tried to pick out a couple of key ones that I think would be important, you know, to maybe review and present. Uh, okay, so let's go ahead and uh, get started then. Okay. So uh, some definitions. Uh, so some preliminary definitions that we'd like to discuss before we, we move on. Uh, the first and foremost is the laguerre polya class. Uh, this is the set of entire functions that can be locally uniform approximated on C by polynomials with only real zeros. Uh, so really that's going to be the theme of the entire dissertation is talking about polynomials that have only real zeros. And of course, you know, the major uh, item is to characterize all, you know, polynomials with only real zeros, or more importantly, all entire functions that can be approximated by polynomials with only real zeros. Uh, in fact, uh, the, the Riemann hypothesis itself uh, can be stated in terms of a particular function uh, that may or may not be in the laguerre polya class, that is, may or may not be approximated uh, by polynomials with only real zeros. Uh, so it's certainly a, a very important topic, and uh, many people have been taking a look at it. Uh, okay, so just to make a note, uh, polynomials with only real zeros are uh, typically called hyperbolic. Uh, and that's where the names are coming from. Uh, we have hyperbolicity preservers, for example, uh, which are operators that map polynomials with only real zeros uh, to more polynomials with only real zeros. Uh, and in general, anytime you use the, the word hyperbolic, when you're in this field, of course, uh, we're talking about uh, uh, um, polynomials with only real zeros. Uh, some of our favorite polynomials with only real zeros are these ones right here the uh, classic orthogonal polynomials. Uh, these are some of the, the most uh, studied non-trivial polynomials with only real zeros. Uh, and uh, of course, they, they serve more than just, they serve a, a better purpose than just being, you know, examples of hyperbolic polynomials, but uh, we'll discuss those as we go through. Uh, okay, so we continue on a little bit uh, with uh, our next definition, uh, the Jensen polynomials. So if you start with a function in the laguerre polya class, um, well, well you don't, it doesn't have to be in the laguerre polya class. Let me back up for a little bit. So if you just start with an entire function, and it's written in you know, the Taylor series expansion, uh, gamma k over k factorial uh, x to the k, uh, then the nth Jensen polynomial is defined with this uh, binomial coefficient 
uh, using the original coefficients of the entire function. And, uh, and what we find is that the Jensen polynomials play a very key role in hyperbolic, uh, hyperbolic um, in, uh, in functions that are in the Laguerre folia class. Uh, so in particular, uh, I think Jensen himself showed that uh, uh, a function in the Laguerre folia class um, will, will be approximated by these Jensen polynomials and uh, all those Jensen polynomials will have only real zeros. And so in, in general, uh, we can use the Jensen polynomials to characterize uh, the Laguerre folia class. Uh, so every entire function has a collection of Jensen polynomials. Uh, so, uh, an interesting point uh, is that the Jensen polynomials can be calculated with a generating function. So, in general, when you formulate a series with two unknowns, here we have an x and a t, uh, then that series is called a generating function. And in particular, there's a, there's a very beautiful relationship here, which is that if you want the Jensen polynomials of f, you simply substitute an x and a t, and then you times it by a e to the t. And, uh, and if you do that, you do end up with a, a series uh, that has uh, the Jensen polynomials as coefficients. Uh, okay, so let's go ahead and uh, continue on then. So uh, interlacing uh, polynomials. Uh, so two polynomials, f of x and g of x, are said to have interlacing zeros. Uh, if f of x and g of x have only real zeros, they're within a degree of each other and uh, every zero of f, every two zeros of f contains a zero of g between them and, uh, and vice versa. So in other words, their zeros kind of do a uh, meshing pattern. And uh, well, we, we, we pull up some examples to demonstrate what interlacing polynomials kind of look like. So you kind of see you have a dotted line, it's got a couple of zeros, but then you have the solid line, and the zeros of the solid line lie between the zeros of the dotted line. Uh, so these are a couple of examples from uh, Fisk's uh, book. Uh, very good read. So if you ever want to, you know, study about interlacing polynomials, uh, he has a 800-page book. You know, it's a 90 read, I guess. Uh, and uh, and he's got some uh, pictures in there on uh, what interlacing polynomials look like. Uh, okay, so let's continue on then. Oh, we may also notice that one of our main theorems over here on the right uses this symbol. Uh, with the double lines, that, uh, that symbol means these two polynomials have interlacing zeros. So uh, one, of, one of our uh, main results from 20, not, our, not my main result, Brandon's main results of 2011, uh, is that uh, Q, the QKs in a differential operator uh, will in fact have uh, interlacing uh, zeros. Uh, okay, so the next definition is uh, stable. So a polynomial p of x is said, uh, a polynomial p of x is stable if all the zeros of p of x lie in h plus uh, closure. So we went ahead and closed the upper half plane. Uh, if we wanted it to be strictly stable, uh, then we could remove the bar, but it's, it's much easier to include the bar. Uh, or all the zeros of p of x are in the lower half plane. So you have them in the upper half plane or the lower half plane. Uh, because real rooted because real value polynomials have uh, zeros in conjugate pairs, uh, then it turns out stable is equivalent to being hyperbolic if you're a real value polynomial. Uh, and so, uh, so in some sense, stable might be considered you know, a slight uh, or, or an alternative definition to being a, a hyperbolic in, in the case of a real value. Uh, okay, so the definition extends a little bit in that we now discuss a, a real value bivariate polynomial instead of a, a univariate polynomial. And, uh, and we say that that polynomial is stable uh, if it is not zero for every x and y in the uh, upper half plane. Now, this definition is kind of the reverse of the univariate case. Uh, and most of that was to kind of try to make the, the statements in, uh, in Borsay and Brandon's papers uh, a little bit easier to read, I suppose. Um, but, but yeah, so it's, it's been adjusted a little bit, so there's still a little debate going on as to what the definition should be or whatnot. Uh, but uh, more importantly, where is this uh, word stable being used? So we go ahead and look over here on our first theorem up on the board. Uh, we see that uh, a, an operator of the form qk d to the k is in fact hyperbolicity preserving. It sends polynomials with real zeros to polynomials with real zeros, if and only if this bivariate polynomial, where you stick a negative in there, 
uh, is, a, is a stable polynomial, uh, meaning that it's not zero for every x and y in the upper half plane. So in this sense, uh, if we're saying Brandon uh, uh, allowed us, or allow us to uh, characterize uh, hyperbolicity preservers in terms of uh, multivariate functions. Right? Uh, okay, we'll talk more about that as we go through history. We should go a little faster. Uh, so some classic orthogonal polynomials. So here I'm just going to let you guys know that when I say classic orthogonal polynomials, I am referring to either the Hermite, the Laguerre, the Jacobi. Uh, any of these polynomials are considered the classic orthogonal polynomials. Uh, and uh, we'll continue on. Uh, a multiplier sequence. So now we're starting to get uh, close to what is discussed in the uh, uh, dissertation. So a sequence of numbers, gamma k, so this is just like any old sequence of numbers, uh, real, real numbers, is called a classical multiplier sequence. If for every hyperbolic polynomial, so I went ahead and gave us a hyperbolic polynomial, uh, the polynomial this, and notice what we did, we multiplied each coefficient by gamma k, uh, also has only real zeros. So in this sense, we, we want this sequence of numbers to operate on polynomials and provide a new set of coefficients for them. Uh, and if it's done in this particular way, uh, and, and it preserves hyperbolicity, that is, it sends hyperbolic polynomials to polynomials that are still hyperbolic, then we call it a, a multiplier sequence. And, uh, and so in some sense, you can kind of think of a multiplier sequence as like an operator, because it sends polynomials to polynomials. And more importantly, it sends hyperbolic polynomials to hyperbolic polynomials. Uh, OK, so given uh, a sequence of polynomials, Bn, so now we're going to go ahead and change the basis, uh, where each uh, Bn has degree n, and the first one is not the zero polynomial. Uh, we call uh, a sequence a Bn multiplier sequence instead of a classical multiplier sequence. Uh, if for every hyperbolic polynomial, and again we write another hyperbolic polynomial, this time in terms of bk, uh, the polynomial with gamma k is, also has only real zeros. So, uh, so rather than studying in terms of the standard basis, that is an x to the k, uh, we've removed the x to the k and changed it into a uh, b, b sub k. And, uh, and the b sub k allows us to, well, uh, study polynomials in, in, a, in a much different light. If you pick different b sub k's, for example, maybe these guys, uh, then uh, what types of uh, uh, multiplier sequences could, could you get? Uh, can we characterize them? Can we find uh, all of the different uh, multiplier sequences uh, for any, any particular b, b sub k? Uh, OK, so let's go ahead and uh, continue on. So in light of multiplier sequences, kind of understanding that they themselves are, are a, an operator that maps polynomials to polynomials. Uh, we make that a little more, more general. That is, you start with an operator, and, uh, and that operator is going to take Bn and map it to gamma n times Bn. Well, uh, given any type of linear operator in this form, uh, you can take it and write it as a, a differential sum with some qk's and, and a d to the k. And, uh, and so we're going to uh, call those things diagonal differential operators. Although, if the T is hyperbolicity preserving, that is, it sends you know, hyperbolic polynomials to hyperbolic polynomials, then this sequence here on the right would be called a BN multiplier sequence. And so we're kind of generalizing uh, uh, the notion of a multiplier sequence to now uh, any, any type of uh, operator. Or we're going to analyze it in more detail, so to speak, right? Uh, OK, so a couple of vocabulary words to maybe uh, uh, get down in order to make sure, because we're going to see this show up throughout the entire presentation, so it's kind of important to understand these uh, little pieces here. So the BNs, which are the uh, original basis we're picking, those are sometimes referred to as the eigenvectors, because they map through the operator and they map to themselves, but they're just off by a coefficient. And then, of course, uh, like all, uh, all operators, uh, if they map to themselves and they're off by that coefficient, that coefficient is referred to as an eigenvalue. So in this uh, uh, setup here, we would refer to the uh, gamma n's as eigenvalues and the b n's as eigenvectors. And, uh, and yeah, and we would continue on in this fashion. Uh, okay, so a note about this middle piece here. So uh, a lot of history has been developed in studying the, the gamma n's and the b n's, but not studying their representation as a differential operator. 
So this is, this is really a, a, a new type of thing, and it was established in uh, 1959 by a, a Petre, and it is, a, it is the very fact that given any linear operator that maps polynomials to polynomials, uh, you can in fact take that operator uh, and write it in this particular form. So we're not, we're not doing any type of specialization here. This is literally every operator that can map polynomials to polynomials. Uh, if they happen to have some eigenvectors and some eigenvalues of each degree, then it can be that form. And so we want to take this setup, this diagonal differential operator, and we want to discuss what properties on the gamma n's, what properties on the v n's, what properties on the q k's uh, give us hyperbolicity preservers. Uh, because that's the name of the theory, right? Is to uh, find all the hyperbolic polynomials or find all the maps that can take hyperbolic polynomials to hyperbolic polynomials. Uh, okay, so let's go ahead and uh, move on then to a little bit of history. So, brief history. Uh, so, hyperbolicity preserving operators is kind of what has led us to where we're at so far. Uh, it mostly started in 1914 with Pulley and Shore. Uh, they completely characterize all uh, multiplier sequences, uh, classical multiplier sequences. So the classic is referring to the standard basis, basis again. Uh, and uh, and their, their characterization is uh, quite remarkable. They demonstrate that if the operator works on a particular uh, sequence of polynomials or a particular entire function, then it must work on the uh, uh, all polynomials that are hyperbolic. And, uh, and that, that classification is uh, quite powerful and, of course, been uh, studied over the years. Uh, now, of course, there's been a lot that's happened since 1914. Uh, you know, many people have studied hyperbolicity preserving operators and multiplier sequences and such. But uh, one of the next results that kind of shows up in the theory is uh, in 18, 1987, uh, an annals paper by Craven, Sordis, and Smith. Uh, they end up proving uh, the, the polya Beamon conjecture. And, uh, and there, there's also an, uh, a parallel uh, item that was proven along with the polio Beamon conjecture, known as the Beamon conjecture. Uh, but the two together demonstrate something very important about uh, order and the laguerre polya class. They demonstrate that like low ordered functions, uh, the derivative attracts their zeros to the real axis, and high ordered functions, derivatives uh, repel the zeros uh, of the function away from the real axis. And, uh, and so this is kind of the, the next step was uh, it kind of uh, re-enlightened or you know, brought people back into the, uh, into the theory of trying to study hyperbolicity preservers or characterize uh, these uh, hyperbolicity preserving operators. Uh, so from here, you see all kinds of stuff showing up. Uh, Craven and Sordes and, uh, and Bleeker uh, went on to do uh, many more papers, uh, in particular, uh, a, um, um, it was shown that within the laguerre polya class, uh, if your um, Taylor series coefficients, the, the gamma k's, are increasing, uh, then in fact uh, you must have a type that's greater than one. Uh, we're kind of generalizing a little bit here, but the point is that using these, uh, these characterizations, uh, Petrowski in 2007 uh, completely characterized for neat multiplier sequences. And so this was our second demonstration of a, of a complete characterization of multiplier sequences. And again, his characterization relates back to uh, the laguerre polya class. And uh, in, in, he establishes that if you know certain properties about a particular function in the laguerre polya class, then uh, you in fact do have a, a neat multiplier sequence. Uh, okay, so we, uh, we continue on down into the theory. Uh, in 2009, uh, another annals paper shows up, or Sam Brandon. Uh, they completely characterize hyperbolicity preservers using uh, multivariate symbols. Uh, now, they, they ended up giving uh, four different theorems. One was for finite order, uh, one was for infinite order, and then two were for uh, stability preservers, not hyperbolicity preservers. So uh, over here on the right, this is the uh, exact uh, statement that we've been working with. Uh, this is the 2009 statement, which is that uh, hyperbolicity preservers are related to this uh, multivariate characterization. Now, uh, this, this theorem is uh, uh, wonderfully beautiful in that it, it demonstrates a strong relationship in how these uh, hyperbolicity preservers are uh, related together, because they're all related by these uh, multivariate polynomials. 
Uh, but of course, one of the issues we have with this theorem, uh, even noted by Borsea and Brandon, uh, is that uh, it, it doesn't, uh, it, it extends the problem uh, to a more difficult one. Meaning that if you want to know what, whether something's hypervelicity preserving or not, well then you have to look at this uh, two variable polynomial and determine whether that's stable. Well, if you wanted to know operators that you know, preserve two variable stability, well then you gotta go and start looking at three variable stable polynomials. And then if you wanna know something about three variable stable uh, preservers, you gotta go to four variable and so on and so forth. And so the problem kind of extends off to to infinity, and it, and it doesn't really bring back uh, the, the spirit of uh, Polya and Shore and Petrowski in that we want to know something about the laguerre polya class uh, that, that defines our uh, hyperbolicity preservers. Right? Uh, okay, so uh, more work is, uh, is done uh, in 2011. Uh, Brandon establishes that if you have a finite order hyperbolicity preserver, uh, then the coefficients, the QKs within the operator, uh, must have interlacing zeros. And again, this is our second statement over on the right-hand side. Uh, okay, so the theory keeps continuing. And uh, in 2011 and 2012, uh, extensive work is done on characterizing Laguerre multiplier sequences. Uh, they, uh, they completely uh, characterize all quadratic Laguerre multiplier sequences. They also uh, demonstrate a, um, a uh, Oh, a uh, subset containment of uh, multiplier sequences, namely that uh, the, the Laguerre multiplier sequences are contained within the Hermite, and the Hermite multiplier sequences are contained in the classical, and so we, we start seeing this theory develop in how these multiplier sequences are characterized. Uh, in 2012, 2013, and 2014, uh, extensive work is done on characterizing the Legendre multiplier sequences, uh, and uh, this is a series of papers, including Forgrash, Petrowski, uh, Yoshida, uh, oh, and, well, it's Yoshida and I. I forgot my name, sorry. But uh, we, we, did a, we did a little bit of work on uh, uh, Legendre multiplier sequences. And so you can see that uh, we're studying these polynomials over and over again. And, uh, and, you know, one might ask why. Why are these polynomials uh, so special? And uh, you know, the, it seems to be well because they work, but uh, but you know, we still don't quite know why. More more theory needs to be be developed. Uh, okay, so in 2014, Brandon and uh, O'Tagren uh, characterized Laguerre multiplier sequences in their entirety. So uh, again, they bring it back to the Laguerre polya class and they demonstrate that it, if this particular uh, uh, sequence of polynomials is within the Laguerre polya class. Uh, then in fact uh, you do have a Laguerre multiplier sequence. And so we have uh, characterizations of Laguerre and of uh, uh, Hermite and the classical, of course. Uh, but of course, the one that's still out there is, is the Jacobi, right? Uh, no one has a characterization for that one uh, yet. And so one of the things I do in this dissertation is I really try to explore uh, why these are so difficult. And I find a number of properties, and we'll show them at the end, um, that uh, the Laguerre and the Hermite satisfy, but the uh, uh, Jacobi, uh, they just seem to not, not want to play well with all the other polynomials out there. Uh, okay, so let's uh, go ahead and continue on. So while all of this is going on, this is for hyperbolicity preserving. We, of course, in the background have lots of statements about uh, orthogonal polynomials that have uh, you know, uh, been developed. Uh, in particular, uh, lots of uniqueness theorems on the uh, Rodrigo type formulas, the three-term re uh, recurrence relations, uh, and, uh, and other such things. In uh, 2005, uh, a uh, graduate student at uh, Berkeley um, named uh, Marianian, uh, she uh, demonstrated that um, the she demonstrated the exact form that a uh, finite um, finite diagonal differential operators for the orthogonal polynomials, uh, she demonstrated exactly what those eigenvalues have to look like. They have to be in a particular form. Uh, and so we'll, we'll make use of this as we go through the, the presentation here. Uh, okay, so we're doing well. So quadratic operators. So that's a little bit of uh, definitions and a little bit of history. So now we're gonna go ahead and start diving in and talking about, you know, some of the things I've uh, worked on and studied uh, over the past couple of years, uh, of course, under uh, Dr. Sordis. 
and, uh, and yeah, let's go ahead and see, see what can cook it. Uh, so consider a, a binomial operator. So we'll start off pretty simple, just kind of keep things uh, nice and easy at first. Uh, so if we start out with a binomial operator, where we have a dn and a, and a, a dm and a dn, and then two coefficients, uh, what type of operators in this form can, uh, can actually be hyperbolicity preserving? Uh, so uh, what operators like this will send polynomials with real zeros to polynomials with real, real zeros? So quite quickly, we, uh, we figure out that if your gap is too wide, that is, if your n and m uh, have, are greater than or equal to 3 when you minus them, right? So they're too far apart. There's too many zero coefficients in between. Uh, then t is not hyperbolicity preserving. It's just not possible. And so this, you know, kind of uh, gives us an idea that maybe these operators uh, look and feel a lot like functions in the laguerre foyer class. Uh, okay. Try another one here. So what happens if they're exactly two apart, right? What happens if they're exactly two apart? Well, uh, if they are two apart and they're both not zero, uh, and you're hyperbolicity preserving, then in fact you can show that p of x must be hyperbolic, uh, and it must, and q of x must be a, a, a negative uh, multiple of p of x. In other words, t must be able to factor into this form. And so what we find out is that if you do have a zero coefficient, typically it seems like you're going to have to factor into a form uh, like this, where you have this d squared minus alpha in between a, a, a p of x and a, and a d to some power, right? And so this d squared minus alpha is uh, known to be hyperbolicity preserving by uh, the um, uh, hermine polane theorem. Um, but of course, you know, it's just nice to kind of see that there is this uh, um, you know, uniformity to how these uh, hyperbolicity preservers are, are developed. Uh, okay, so uh, let's, let's make it more complicated then. So what about trying to go to uh, the next case? Well, trinomial operators. Uh, these are uh, definitely a lot more complicated than the binomial operators. Uh, in fact, they're so complicated, uh, we're going to put some restrictions on it. We're not going to let the QK be greater than degree 2. Q1 be the great, greater than Q1, and the Q0 will be a constant. So we're going to force that to happen, and we'll assume that they're not the zero polynomial. We don't want to have to deal with that case. It was uh, kind of addressed in, in the previous cases anyway. It turns out this one simple, you know, little tiny thing here is, is quite complicated, and for the following reasons. We'll just point out that this here uh, uh, incorporates every single differential equation that one could define for the Hermite, the Laguerre, and the Jacobi. And so, in fact, characterizing all of these operators would include uh, characterizing all of the quadratic multiplier sequences for all of the orthogonal polynomials. Right? And, uh, and well, that's what we start aiming to try and do. So we start developing this list and talking about uh, different types of cases. So here, I just started uh, writing through them uh, what if you have a constant, 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 or linear constant, constant, or all these different cases, what types of conditions guarantee hyperbolicity preserving? What types of conditions uh, give us this uh, if and only if uh, for our hyperbolicity preservers? Uh, and, uh, and some of these are quite surprising. Uh, most of them are not so bad to, uh, to figure out, especially using the uh, uh, theorem of Borsay and Brandon of 2009. Uh, but this one, this one took quite a bit of time. Uh, this, the, and it's a strange one too. It's like this Tehran type inequality. Uh, there were a lot of pictures used and various lemmas. Uh, and this one was a, a, a research paper done by uh, Yoshida and I uh, about two years ago. We actually figured this one out. And so this one was most certainly the most difficult case uh, versus the uh, other cases. Uh, okay, so just quite quickly, we'll point out a couple of these just to see what they, uh, uh, what insights they might develop for us. So what happens if you have a linear, a constant, and a constant? So you have like degree one, and then you have degree zero and degree zero. Well, according to the chart, you're not hyperbolicity preserving. That's just not going to happen. Well, you can actually generalize this uh, in a little more detail in the following way. If you give me any hyper, if you give me any operator where p2 is degree n plus 1, p1 is degree n, p0 is degree n, so that you have like this, you know, kink motion, n plus 1, n, and n, 
uh, you're not hyperbolicity preserving. It's just not going to happen. Uh, and that's, that seems like a kind of weird, surprising thing. It makes us think that the degree sequence has to follow maybe a convexity type property. Because you could have a linear, a linear and a constant, but you can't have a linear and then a constant and then a constant that's not allowed. Uh, but of course, you know, math isn't so nice to us when we think we understand it, we really don't. Uh, it turns out that if you have a, a quadratic, a linear and a constant, there are hyperbolicity preservers, and I gave the interval. If you have a quadratic, a linear, and a linear, then by the theorem, you're not hyperbolicity preserving. But then if you go to a quadratic, a linear, and another quadratic, so you make it even more worse than what we thought it was, you make it like V-shaped, suddenly it's hyperbolicity preserving again. And uh, it seems like with more strength than what was originally allowed with the uh, you know, quadratic, linear, and constant. So just some very strange you know, uh, uh, pieces of information to develop from, from this list of uh, stuff. Uh, OK, so we point out another one. So here we have a, 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 a constant, and then a linear, and then a constant. And we see here uh, that the conditions are quite, quite small, uh, considering that the other ones typically seem to have like three conditions uh, or more. In fact, how can we say, or what can we say about these conditions specifically? Well, we can say something along the lines of this. If you have a negative one, an x, and a c, uh, then you will be hyperbolicity preserving for every c greater than zero. It doesn't matter the c you pick. It can go off to, to uh, infinity. I was so concerned that maybe this wasn't true, I actually came up with two ways to prove it. <laughs> and uh, one of them was with the uh, uh, affine transformations of the Hermite polynomials. Uh, and, uh, but if we look at these other ones, let's see here. We have a quadratic, a linear, and a constant. A quadratic, a linear, a constant. A linear, a linear, a constant a constant, a constant, and a third constant, all of these will fail to be hyperbolicity preserving if you pick a C sufficiently large. There will be some C, no matter what, that will make it not hyperbolicity preserving anymore. And so it's kind of strange to see that there's this cap on the C here, but then as soon as you allow a linear and, I mean, a constant and a linear uh, that kind of do a negative coefficient and a positive coefficient, uh, the C can go off to infinity, and it will still be hyperbolicity preserving uh, the whole time. Um, okay, so we, uh, we continue on then. So uh, is there a way to maybe take all of these and put it under one heading? Is there a comprehensive way to talk about all these conditions all at once? Uh, it turns out there is. If you take each of the Q's and you replace a uh, R inside, uh, inside of those polynomials, and uh, what you're staring at is a uh, polynomial in the laguerre polya class, then in fact this condition is, uh, is equivalent to all of these all at once. And so we can, in some sense, uh, put them all together in one heading uh, by uh, now getting back to the laguerre polya class. If we can show that this is in the laguerre polya class for all R, then that, in fact, will show that this original operator uh, is hyperbolicity preserving. And so it's nice to see LP again, which has been you know, missing in a couple theorems uh, over the past uh, few years and such, it was like, for example, uh, or say in Brandon's theorem, which doesn't relate back to the laguerre polya class. Uh, and so this is where we're aiming. We're trying to always get back to that laguerre polya class. Now, we don't just stop here. We say, well, what if we drop the uh, zero condition? Well, it turns out that this no longer holds. You can't, you can't drop the zero condition. Uh, a very simple example is uh, the x squared r squared minus 1, uh, which, is, uh, in, which is in the laguerre polya class for all r, but it's not, not a hyperbolicity. Uh, but we do develop a, another uh, uh, strange, strange inequality. Um, this is uh, what we've denoted as the uh, Tehran Ronskin inequality. Uh, we're not quite sure what to make of it, but uh, this was found by Yoshida and I in our uh, original paper uh, a few years ago. And uh, it, it is equivalent to this being hyperbolicity preserving, and uh, you don't have to necessarily assume a, a zero coefficient. And we can kind of see here. Uh, properties of interlacing showing up inside of the, the inequality. Uh, you can also do something along these lines, rather than, you know, you switch the x and r and you end up with a slightly different uh, statement. And, uh, and this inequality is exactly equivalent to this one, uh, but only in the most complicated case. In the uh, uh, simpler cases, they aren't uh, as, uh, as related. 
so finally, we come up with you know at least uh, what we think would be a good starting point for trying to characterize all hyperbolicity preservers in, in terms of functions in the Laguerre Polya class. And it's uh, the following statement: If you have any non-trivial hyperbolicity preserver, then in fact these two entire functions must be in the Laguerre Polya class for any R. And so this this is us coming back in the, in the spirit of Polya and Short, coming back to the Laguerre Polya class. Uh, okay, so let's continue on then. So some eigenvalues. Uh, so we'll go back to our uh, uh, operator here, our diagonal differential operator. Uh, can we come up with uh, a more comprehensive understanding in how these eigenvalues are developed or found when you're given a, uh, an operator of this form? Uh, yes, yes we can. So uh, for each n in the natural numbers, uh, every eigenvalue can be calculated with the following formula. Uh, now this formula, it's actually not so bad to find. Uh, it required uh, doing a couple derivatives and then canceling out some stuff. But, uh, and I've also seen this formula in a couple of other forms uh, in crawl and, uh, and an another paper uh, with crawl. Uh, it might have been um, what, what are those orthogonal papers, Creer or, or Trichomy. Uh, but, uh, uh, so we see this showing up here and there. Uh, I even saw this, uh, the quadratic form of this uh, in, a, in a posted forum when I was uh, looking through math stuff online. Uh, and so every now and then this seems to kind of crop up, uh, but I've never seen it actually stated in its uh, a full generality. So, uh, so this, this does seem to be definitely new, but more importantly is all the consequences we get from this theorem, which are absolutely incredible. Uh, and so we'll go through, go through that list. Uh, so one of the things we notice is that when you look at this formula here, which allows us to calculate these uh, eigenvalues, uh, we have this n located in the binomial coefficient. If I replace that n with an x, I'm now staring at a polynomial, uh, as long as these uh, qk's uh, are eventually zero and stay zero indefinitely. And so what we find is, uh, is that we can now talk about polynomial interpolated eigenvalues and exactly what that forces the corresponding operator to look like. And so we end up with a couple of statements. Uh, for example, if t is finite order, so if this infinity here is finite, then in fact the gamma n's can be interpolated by a polynomial. They can be written as a polynomial where uh, an n has been substituted for, for the x. Uh, so we take this statement one and we write a couple more statements that are very similar to the previous one uh, just to kind of get a better understanding of what, what we're trying to say. Uh, if gamma n can't be interpolated by a polynomial, then t must be of infinite order. So just the uh, uh, contrapo not contrapo yeah, contrapositive of that. Uh, if uh, gamma n is a, a non-constant sequence with a bounded subsequence, then t must be of infinite order. Uh, and so on and so forth. And then this last one, number five. If gamma n is not a non-constant alternating sequence, then t must be of infinite order. And it's quite surprising that throughout the literature, uh, this little fact here has kind of gone unnoticed for, for quite a long time. And, uh, and so we, we give a very concrete example to demonstrate uh, how this works. Oh, first the theorem. So you can, you can take this theorem one step further and actually demonstrate that in the Hermite, the Laguerre, or the classical case, T will be a finite order operator if and only if gamma n can be interpolated by a polynomial. And so in some sense, we've completely characterized uh, what finite order operators look like if they diagonalize on the Hermite, the Laguerre, or the classical. They all must have eigenvalues that are interpolated by polynomials. Uh, oh, to our example for number five. Uh, so here, here's the most lovely example in the entire world. Uh, if you have a, a nice lovely n as your uh, eigenvalues on a, a Hermite polynomial, you get this beautiful uh, a finite order differential operator. But if you just take that n and you put a negative one to the n next to it, ta-da, it's now no longer finite. It becomes an infinite order differential operator. And that's what we've proven here, is that in fact this will go off to infinity forever. It will continue and continue forever. Uh, and so this here is just one example of many where we've studied these uh, sequences over and over again, eigenvalue sequences, uh, but it's gone unnoticed that they might be actually infinite order differential operators. And for example, relating these uh, QKs together uh, is, certainly seems like a, a, a very interesting challenge. 
Uh, but of course, in the dissertation, I do give uh, formulas that allow you to go from these two QKs here to all of these ones and vice versa. There is a, a, an interlacing relationship between them uh, that I find for the Hermit uh, polynomials uh, in particular. Uh, furthermore, we can show for the Hermit that uh, all of these QKs will in fact be interlacing um, uh, even in the infinite order uh, differential case. And so uh, we, we, we actually study the Hermit polynomials in the dissertation quite a bit. So one last thing about the Hermit polynomials. Uh, in the dissertation is also a, a new algebraic characterization of the Hermit uh, multiplier sequences. So uh, lots and lots of uh, examples of uh, Hermit polynomials are established. Uh, okay, so let's go ahead and uh, finish up here then. So differential, oh, oh. Oh, one last, one last point. Okay, so this is a lot to read, so don't worry about trying to read the whole thing. Uh, so one last point about the uh, eigenvalues. So it turns out with the uh, eigenvalues, uh, in the Hermite and the Laguerre and the uh, Legendre cases, uh, we can, in fact, uh, give the exact differential forms of uh, each of those operators. So here uh, I've denoted pi 0, pi 1, and pi n minus 1. And, uh, and those are supposed to be exactly polynomials of their respective degrees. So this is a, uh, uh, in some sense, a, a drastic extension of uh, Mir Mirianian's results, which tells us what the eigenvalues of these operators have to look like. So we're now on the other end demonstrating what the operators have to look like uh, given those particular, particular eigenvalues. Uh, of course, we're assuming hyperbolicity preserving here. Uh, and we can exhibit examples where this doesn't hold not hyperbolicity preserving. So in some sense, this is like best case scenario when it comes to uh, characterizing the degree sequences of the Hermit, the Laguerre, and, and the Jacobi. Uh, there's a, a general open question uh, which states, uh, does this uh, uniformity of degrees uh, hold in any finite uh, hyperbolicity uh, diagonal differential operator? And uh, apparently, it's, it's not known. Step towards uh, possibly answering that problem. Uh, okay, so let's uh, let's continue on then. So we take these eigenvalues, which is in some sense uh, uh, a piece of how this operator behaves, and we discover that these uh, eigenvalues are kind of related to the leading terms uh, of the QKs in the differential operator. So one thing we do in the dissertation is we say, well. Can we take that a step further? Can we take these operators and maybe do more splicing to them, more cutting up, and you know maybe expand them into uh, some type of a special sum? And uh, and in fact, that's what we do. So uh, one of one of our uh, pinnacle results in the dissertation uh, is that given any linear operator, we demonstrate you can find a sequence of classical operators so that t can be written in this particular sum. Uh, moreover, if T is a diagonal differential operator, that is, it has some eigenvectors, then uh, the uh, principal part uh, disappears, and you just have what is stated, stated here. And so uh, we might say, well, how is this related to hyperbolicity preserving? Given a, let's say, Hermit multiplier sequence, what can we say about these classic multiplier sequences that are located within the sum? Uh, so we bring up uh, Petrowski's, one of Petrowski's main results in his dissertation is that uh, uh, given any BN multiplier sequence, uh, it is in fact a classical multiplier sequence. So we take that one step further and we demonstrate that if T is hyperbolicity preserving, then T0 is hyperbolicity preserving. And in fact, that T0 is the operator uh, for the classical multiplier sequences that has the same eigenvalues as the original operator. So this statement here is precisely Petrowski's statement, but now in a differential form. And so uh, we, we even extend this to, uh, to hold in all triangular operators, so you don't even have to have a, uh, a diagonalizing uh, eigenvector sequence. Uh, and in this sense, this allows us to actually associate uh, a multiplier sequence to every triangular uh, linear operator, um, uh, if it's hyperbolicity. And so, so we go a little bit further where we say, well, that's nice and all, but can we, can we go further, right? And the answer is yes. If T is hyperbolicity preserving and it's Hermit or Laguerre, then in fact all the TNs will be hyperbolicity preserving. And so in some sense, 
every Hermite multiplier sequence and every Laguerre multiplier sequence can be written uniquely as a sum of classical multiplier sequences. And, uh, and this kind of summarizes one of our, our main results. Uh, okay, so let me go ahead and uh, continue on again. So with respect to hyperbolistic preservation, uh, how different are the Hermite and Laguerre polynomials from the Legendre? So we just give a quick list here. Uh, as we've seen throughout our discussions here, the Hermite and Laguerre diagonal differential operators, they're finite order if and only if they have eigenvalues that can be interpolated by polynomials. We can have that as a uh, statement. Uh, the diagonalizations of Hermite and Laguerre diagonal differential uh, hyperbolicity preserving operators, that is the TNs, uh, must also be hyperbolicity preserving. Uh, we go on to find a couple more properties. Uh, the Hermite and Laguerre polynomials can serve as the QKs in a hyperbolicity preserver. Uh, not quite the QKs, you have to divide them out by a K factorial, but uh, roughly speaking, they, they work, as, uh, work in a hyperbolicity preserver. Uh, the Hermite and Laguerre monomial transformations are hyperbolicity preserving operators. So if you take uh, x to the n and you map it to the Hermite polynomials or map it to the Laguerre polynomials, uh, you have a perfectly fine hyperbolicity preserving uh, um, operator. Uh, the Hermite and Laguerre polynomials are reversed or uh, reversed Jensen or Jensen polynomials of functions in the Laguerre polya class. I really think it's item five that probably gives the Hermite and Laguerre polynomials uh, all, the, all the properties that we see exhibited here. Um, and, uh, and I mean, that's just my own belief, but you know, math isn't run on beliefs, it's run on facts. Uh, so what is, what is a fact then? Uh, all of these fail for the Legendre, and that's just a most, most unfortunate thing. Every time we think we're on to something very cool for the Legendre, uh, they, they seem to not have any of these properties. And so, uh, just to make it clear, the Legendre, there are eigenvalue sequences for them that give infinite order differential operators. And there are, they, they cannot serve as the QKs in a hyperbolicity preserver. And uh, their monomial trans their, the monomial transformation for the Legendre polynomials is not hyperbolicity preserving. And so, uh, we have those as uh, lots of examples just demonstrating the very um, uh, unique nature of the Legendre polynomials, and really why uh, they are they are uh, the next next phase of study in uh, hyperbolicity preserving um, uh, theory. Uh, okay, so we end with a couple of uh, open questions. Uh, these are some of the, the main open questions within the dissertation, uh, and uh, thank you. Yes, uh, uh, very much so. Um, the uh, differential equations for the Hermite and Laguerre, uh, their eigenvalues are, well, you can, you can modify them a little bit. They have simply an n next to them, like hn and uh, ln. But the uh, Jacobi, uh, or we'll just do it for the Legendre to make it a little easier. The Legendre, uh, they unfortunately have eigenvalues that look like this. And so, I really think this is just a troubling problem uh, within, uh, within how these uh, things develop. It's really this right here that actually allows the existence of infinite order uh, differential operators that still have polynomial uh, um, interpolated eigenvalues. Um, so specifically, just to make it clear, if you write T Legendre uh, N and then put the Legendre, and then you calculate this guy, it's infinite order. And it's because if it, if it wanted to be quadratic, it would have had to be an n squared plus n. And that doesn't happen with the Hermite and the Laguerre. Uh, so yeah, there, there's, some, there's some property about the minimal differential.
differential equation there. Thank you again.